Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is the Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, the convoy is too big to ignore, so now Justin Trudeau and the media are vilifying it, plus former Newfoundland Premier Brian Packford on his charter challenge against the federal government. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Hello and welcome to The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. This is Canada's most irreverent talk show on Thursday, January 27th, two days away from the great big convoy on its way as I speak to the nation's capital of Ottawa. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the convoy. And also, I should tell you, I'm going to be going to Ottawa for the convoy. And that'll be a lot of fun. We'll have lots of reports from there on the weekend. But I, I'll talk about that later on. I do want to talk a little bit about what's coming up on the show today because later on, we'll be speaking to Brian Peckford, the former Premier of Newfoundland, a repeat guest. We've had him on the show before and he had a very significant, very significant fan base of people that said you have to have him back on. So we'll be talking to him about what he is doing to end the unscientific restrictions that we have dominating the federal government's COVID response. That's later on in the show. But first, let's talk about the convoy because originally, and I think when I was talking about this two days ago, the media was just starting to sort of pay attention. But for the most part, the media was not giving the convoy all that much credit. There was that silly story out in BC when CBC was reporting on a, a couple of dozen trucks that were protesting road conditions while there was a much larger convoy that was headed to Ottawa to protest vaccine mandates, among other things. And now media has started covering it, but you can tell that a lot of the political elites are very nervous about this because instead of ignoring it, it's so big that they they can't do it. They're just vilifying it now. So the rhetoric has changed dramatically and all of the discussion about it is now, oh, this is heading to be some January 6th event. This is going to be some attempted coup on parliament buildings. People trying to attribute violent motives to those in the convoy before this thing has even happened, before anyone has got to Ottawa. Now, let me say first off that this is not at all, in my view, out of the realm of possibility that someone could do something bad. And I think all of the organizers, all of the people supporting the convoy need to condemn that when it happens. I am supporting the convoy as a peaceful protest. I'm supporting the convoy's message of opposing vaccine mandates, but in general, taking a stand for freedom. I unequivocally denounce anyone who uses this for whatever reason, for any form of violence or illegality. That is not what this is about. And if it becomes that, I'll deal with that. But a lot of the people, and you see this in the media coverage, are hoping it will be violent. They're hoping this will be the very worst case scenario. My view on this is anytime we have thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people getting together, expressing their political views safely, even if I disagree with those views, that's a victory for a free society. That's a victory for democracy. I would never hope for the worst. When Black Lives Matter protests were going on last year, I wasn't sitting at home saying, ooh, 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 I hope it goes violent so I can use that to, you know, wedge my political opponents. No, I say, great, they made a point as they have a right to do. Those in the convoy are doing the same thing. They are making a point because they have a right to do it. And in this case, I think it is an incredibly important point. All of the things that I've talked about in the last few weeks on this show about my pessimism, about where Canadians are on vaccine mandates, on vaccine passports, that's starting to turn. And one of the reasons I've been so motivated this week, I've been tweeting nonstop, I've been writing columns, doing shows, doing interviews. One of the reasons is because for the first time in the pandemic, I'm feeling optimistic. I, I don't know why it is. Well, I do know why it is, but I don't know why it's taken this long. But for the first time, I'm feeling like things are turning. Because what I'm seeing in my circles and outside my circles, I really try to avoid being in an echo chamber, is that there is a huge divide between how Ottawa, how downtown Ottawa views and speaks about the convoy and how everyone else in the world familiar with it is doing it. And, and I'm very deliberate when I say in the world. And we'll go through some of the examples of this because the, the parliamentary press gallery coverage has by and large been that this is just, again, an attempted coup. It's going to be Canada's January 6th incident. But everyone else is saying this is great. 
There's a reason that this has been on Fox News in the U.S., GB News in the U.K., Donald Trump Jr. did a video about it. People from Europe that are part of the protest movements against lockdowns have been sharing this. This is massive. This is global now. Because Canada is entering the big leagues as far as citizens that are taking a stand for their rights. And in a lot of ways, this is being more favorably viewed outside of Canada than it is by the elites in Canada. And I think that's very telling because we are seeing something that's part of a global movement. I did uh, two days ago, I think, or maybe it was yesterday, a 30-minute long interview with an American radio station. And it was a host I, I've known. I've, I've done some stuff with him in the past. But he said his listeners were fascinated. He's doing coverage of this every day. He's in the U.S. It doesn't really affect him all that much. Certainly, it might affect some of his audience because American truckers are evidently affected by this vaccine mandate. But there's a message that's being shared here that is resonating with people that's managed to turn my pessimism into at least a glimmer of optimism as we head into the weekend. It's why I'm so thrilled to be going to Ottawa on the weekend to actually see this. This is going to be historic one way or another. Now, I should say, I don't buy most of the numbers that have been given. People throw out numbers like, oh, there are going to be a million people, 50,000. I, I don't buy any of that. I think there are going to be a lot of people. I think there are going to be thousands. I don't know how many trucks. I've seen reports that the convoy has stretched over 70 kilometers long. I don't know how what that is in trucks. I don't know how many car lengths between them. I have heard some reports that the Ontario-Manitoba border, where they crossed Wednesday, I think it was, there were about 900 trucks that crossed at that particular point. Now, there are other routes. People are coming from Windsor uh, up the 401. People are coming from Eastern Canada. So who knows? But the whole point is we're not talking about nothing here. And as I mentioned on the show the other day, anyone who's spent any time in downtown Ottawa will know this will be noticed. It might be just infuriating if you're trying to get around. I feel bad if anyone has a meeting they have to get to in Ottawa. Not that anyone in downtown Ottawa works on Saturday, but you know what I mean? It's going to be difficult to get around because this is going to be something that the city's infrastructure is not designed to handle, but it's going to be noticed. It's going to be seen and it is making a point, and that point is resonating. And even if Justin Trudeau wants to diminish and denounce it, that doesn't mean that ordinary people are not seeing it. On that note, let's talk about Justin Trudeau's response. Canadians have stepped up to protect each other, to protect our frontline workers, to protect our elders, to protect our young people, to protect people like truckers who are putting food on our grocery store shelves. Canadians have stepped up to do the right thing to protect the freedoms and the rights of Canadians to get back to the things we love to do. We know the way through this pandemic is by getting everyone vaccinated. And the overwhelming majority, close to 90% of Canadians, have done exactly that. The small fringe minority of people who are on their way to Ottawa or who are uh, holding unacceptable uh, views uh, that they are expressing do not represent the views of Canadians who have been there for each other, who know that following the science and stepping up to protect each other is the best way to continue to ensure our freedoms, our rights, our values as a country. Ooh, unacceptable views. That, did you hear that? That's what these are. The, the people that are going to Ottawa have unacceptable views. Well, what are those views? What is this about? I actually got a little bit of pushback on the show last week because I said that this is a protest about vaccine mandates first and foremost. And I, I was clear to make the point that it has become about something bigger. But the genesis of this is truckers affected by a mandate from the government resisting that mandate. That was the start. That doesn't mean it hasn't ballooned beyond that. But at its core, the biggest threats to freedom right now are coming in the form of vaccine mandates and vaccine passports. So I think it's fair to say that this is a protest that, yes, is about freedom, but the freedom to do what? The freedom to live your life, make your own decisions, and not have the government outlaw your industry or, or segregate you in society and that all of these related things. So this, this is unacceptable to Justin Trudeau. Whatever happened to we must reach out, diversity is our strength, not diversity of opinion, mind you, clearly. 
or this tweet in 2020 when Justin Trudeau talked at the beginning of the pandemic when everyone was still clanging their pots and pans for essential workers saying that we should all thank a trucker. We should all be so grateful to the truckers. And now the truckers are harboring unacceptable views as they head to Ottawa to protest his government. That's the message he's sending, that if you don't like him, if you don't support his handling of the pandemic, that is just an unacceptable view. Now, mind you, unacceptable is still better than racist, sexist, misogynist, so at least the insults are coming down a little bit. I took aim on Tuesday about Aaron O'Toole's lack of response to this, and I'm semi-pleased to report there's been a bit of a response from Aaron O'Toole. Now, first off, I want to talk about the response from Conservative members of Parliament, because I listed a handful on the last show that had come out that had seemingly broken ranks with O'Toole's inability or unwillingness to say what he thought of the convoy, and now I can't even list them all. There are so many. There are people like John Barlow and Leslin Lewis and Andrew Scheer and Pierre Paul and Bob Zimmer. I, these are just names that just happened to come across my desk recently, but so many members of the Conservatives are, are getting behind this. A lot of them are going to be there. A lot of them have seen the convoy off as it's gone through their town. Aaron O'Toole, I thought, would do a video or something. He did an op-ed in the Toronto Sun. Now, I'm going to try to be generous here, but I have to point out that he did not use the word convoy once in the story. So th this is a column about the truckers, about the protests, but he didn't use the word convoy, which I, I don't think is an oversight. I think it's deliberate. He, he talked about it in more general terms about those coming to Ottawa right now, the truckers coming to Ottawa. And he says that, you know, the pandemic's tough, yada, yada, yada. You have to get down to like paragraph, I don't know, nine or 10 or something like that before he says that truckers plan to be in Ottawa to protest the policy. He says they've been through a lot so you can understand why they are protesting. He says Canadians have a right to be heard, not just in an election, but at all times, especially in these extraordinary circumstances. Thousands of Canadians have spent their hard-earned money to come to Ottawa. Any reasonable concerns must be heard. They have a right to be heard. And then he says, which is fair, that he condemns anyone that tries to exploit this movement to put a violent or hateful or threatening tone. He says hate and bigotry have no place. He loves the country. It upsets him that some people might try to shoehorn violent motives into this. Uh, and I think that's fair. I, I think he needs to put that on the record because obviously he wants some distance between him and this if it goes wrong. But he says they have a right to be heard and they should be heard. It's not exactly a statement of support, but at least it's something. At least he's not condemning and vilifying, which, by the way, is more likely to cause there to be a violent outcome than anything else. The rhetoric that people like Justin Trudeau and NDP leader Jagmeet Singh are heaping on this is more likely to inflame tensions than anything else. But again, here's my message to anyone who's part of this convoy, either officially or unofficially. If you stoop to the level the left wants you to stoop to, all you do is give them a win. It's wrong. It's first and foremost wrong. It's morally wrong on its own. But even politically, it is not helping your cause in any way whatsoever. It's giving them the win. So do not go there whatsoever. And I will not hesitate to condemn and denounce preemptively and after the fact as well, if such a thing happens. But I note that it's only the right that's forced to answer for the worst of its movements. It's only the right that's forced to do that. I got to share, this is, this is hilarious in a way, but still shameful. This was a, a report in Parliament Today, which is a, a Parliament Hill-focused publication uh, that came out yesterday, and they quoted a national security expert, and I use the word expert in a very loose sense there, saying that anyone who donated to the GoFundMe, which has reached millions and millions of dollars now, I'm not even going to give a number because it'll change by the time I've, I finish recording, could be strung up on terrorism financing charges. That's the that's the messaging the media is putting out here. The quote is that uh, those who have donated to groups in support of the ongoing truck rallies could be found guilty under the criminal code as they directly or indirectly could provide financial services intended to carry out any terrorist activity or benefit such a group. So, uh, you know, I, I just imagine that if you do get strung up for this, it's going to make for some very awkward conversations in the jail cell because you're going to be beside a guy who smuggled arms to ISIS and he's going to be like, oh yeah, what are you in for? Smuggling arms to ISIS too? And you'll be like, no, I, I gave $10 to a trucker.
Yeah, that's basically where things are now. So if you if you donated to the GoFundMe, be careful. The RCMP could be coming for you uh, because according to this national security expert quoted in the media, you are a, a terror financier, or should I say you are potentially a terror financier. You could potentially be charged. You got to leave, leave yourself some wiggle room there. But this is what we're up against. Global News ran a story as well in which they focused on this as being uh, this far right hate movement. And they say, even in the story, that, well, it's not everyone. I mean, it's, but why focus on that? Why are you defining the whole based on the minority? Why are you defining the whole? based on what is very clearly an outlier. The organizers have condemned it. They've said, if you want to put any violence into this, stay home. We do not want you here. This is not what we're about. And that, to me, is an entirely saleable point. I think it's the most important point of this. So this is a peaceful protest through and through. And it should remain that. And the critics are not warning because they're trying to protect public safety. They're warning because they're trying to delegitimize a movement that is gaining steam and threatening their ironclad grip on public opinion. That's what's happening here. Justin Trudeau doesn't like that the tide may be turning. People may not be all of a sudden fans of lockdowns and vaccine mandates. So all he can do is scapegoat this group that's making a point that more and more Canadians are agreeing with. You look at some of the footage of people lining the streets, lining the overpasses. There was a video I came across of a bunch of women. I don't even know what town it was. They were making sandwiches for the truckers while singing O Canada. And, and I said on Twitter, I didn't know what people would find more triggering, that they sang the O Canada lyrics with uh, sons in it or that it was women making uh, sandwiches for men. I didn't know which would be uh, more off-putting to people. But this is a movement. This is a movement, and it's one that's growing. And I don't know what it's going to look like on Ottawa. I don't know what the final tally is going to be. Getting people to stand out in the cold in Ottawa at the end of January is difficult, but people are prepared to do that. And it's not just about truckers. There are hundreds of sedans, uh, pickup trucks that are non-commercial, farm vehicles of people taking some time off that are joining this convoy. It isn't just big rigs. And to be honest, well, the, again, the genesis of this was about the uh, stuff that truckers are facing. It has become about so much more. It has become about so much more, and I think will continue to be. And interestingly enough, a lot has been made about the fact that the Canadian Trucking Alliance, which is the, uh, not I don't want to say official, but more of one of the established uh, tr groups representing truckers, they've actually said that they condemn this. They've said it doesn't represent them. The majority of truckers are vaccinated, and, and that's that. And whatever you think of their position, that's their position. But they do not represent truckers, we're seeing. They don't represent all truckers, I should say. And it's very much like teachers' unions. We get messages all the time from teachers' union members saying, you know what my union said about this doesn't represent me, and so on and so forth. And also, I would say other groups are coming out against it, like the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, CFIB. They've said that they're opposed to the trucker vaccine mandate. So they're doing a better job, I think, representing the diversity of opinions in the trucking industry than the group that's supposed to represent the trucking industry itself is doing. One point I'll make before I wrap up this segment is that there are going to be a lot of people, and we're seeing this right now in the conservative movement. Aaron O'Toole wouldn't take a position. When he finally did, it was a lukewarm position. At least he's not condemning. But his caucus members, as mentioned earlier, including, again, high-ranking people, the deputy leader of the conservatives even, Candace Bergen, have been very clear that they support the message. And I think they've also been clear indirectly that they're not following O'Toole's lead anymore. They're not waiting for O'Toole to decide what to do and, and going whichever way he goes. And I think that's been the, the big story that will be enduring beyond the convoy here. It's no surprise that there have been several electoral district associations, so the local conservative chapters, if you will, this week that have called for early leadership reviews. I, I think there have been four or five of them now. There could be some more as this gathers a bit of momentum. So local conservative grassroots groups that are saying, you know what, we want to have a say on O'Toole's leadership, not in 2023, but right now. By no later than June was what I think one of the letters or, or all of the letters that these groups signed was, uh, was saying. So that's going to be a big problem for O'Toole. Now, the Globe and Mail and the mainstream media, they're saying that O'Toole needs to just run so far away from this. They don't want there to be any daylight between Aaron O'Toole's position and Justin Trudeau's position. The Globe said he's going to get run over unless he distances himself and condemns the convoy. 
But that's the message, is that these people are unworthy of being heard, these people don't have a right to process, and more importantly, that no one has a right to tell the government, hey, you don't get to make decisions about our bodies, about our health care, that you're not allowed to say that to the government. If you say that, it is just, in Justin Trudeau's immortal words, unacceptable. We've got to wrap things up for this segment. We'll be back in a couple of moments with a can't-miss interview with former Newfoundland Premier Brian Peckford. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back. Well, obviously, some of the people who wanted to go to Ottawa for the big rally have not been able to if they had to fly to get there. Not everyone has a big rig or can take the time to drive across the country. And that's because there still is, in effect right now, a vaccine mandate for air travel. No end in sight to this. No willingness from Justin Trudeau to ease up on this. Even as we've moved to the Omicron era, in which whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated doesn't seem to have too much of an effect in whether you're going to catch or spread Omicron. So what's happening now is people are fed up with this air travel vaccine mandate that like anything else is looking like it's going to be this indefinite measure that we never really get rid of, much like the vaccine passport, much like a lot of the other restrictions. There's a big challenge that was launched this week in federal court by Brian Peckford and other applicants as well. But Brian Peckford is notable because he is the former premier of Newfoundland. He's also the last surviving of the crafters of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms of the Constitution Act of 1982. He's the last living of those premiers that were negotiating and adopting in the 1980s and ultimately in 1982, the document that now forms the backbone of Canadian rights and freedoms. And or is supposed to anyway. We'll get to that in a little bit. But why this is important is because Brian Peckford is filing a charter challenge. He's saying that the government is ignoring the charter that is the linchpin in his legacy as a premier. I'll let him explain exactly why that is. Brian Peckford joins me now, the Honorable Brian Peckford. It's good to speak to you, sir. Thanks very much for your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Now, we talked last time, it's uh, nearly 40 years since the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms was adopted, since the Constitution was brought home, as they say, and you're now taking the government to court for violating the, the very charter in which you were instrumental in passing. Why? Yeah, I, th I think this is rather historic. I don't know of any other First Minister in the history of Canada who's taken the federal government to court over something that that First Minister had a hand in creating and writing. And why I'm doing it, Andrew, is because over the series of months since I talked to you and before even that, you know, I've been watching, as many Canadians have, with great alarm, as the governments have moved more and more uh, in the field of restricting individual rights and freedoms. And of course, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is very dear to my heart, being one of those who was involved in creating it. And uh, I've, made, I've issued many statements. I've done very many interviews, 50 or 60 interviews across the country. Uh, and I've done a lot of public meetings and so on. And I've heard from an awful lot of people. And a lot of them agree with me that if we don't uh, win and the, uh, and the Constitution and the Charter is honored this time around, this will establish a precedent which will dilute the power uh, of the Charter next time round. And therefore, it's going to be this erosion of our individual rights and freedoms. And I guess a lot of people would say um, the violation of our individual rights are, are not, is not justified, even under Section 1 of the, of the Charter. My argument, of course, is that Section 1 doesn't even apply because I remember well that Section 1 was supposed to apply when the state was in peril. The state is not in, in peril. And we had alternatives, as Lieutenant Colonel Redmond has pointed out, as uh, early treatment uh, the doctors have pointed out, right? We, we've, we've had alternatives to doing this, the Great Barrington Declaration. So it's not like we didn't have alternatives. So my point is, the ind my individual right as a Canadian to travel freely in this country has been severely curtailed without justification and is necessary for me as one Canadian and of one person who's been involved in the, the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to stand up for the individual Canadian. 
before we get to the bigger picture and, and also to section one, which I'm glad you've raised there, let, let's talk about what your complaint is, because specifically you're taking issue with the vaccine mandate that Justin Trudeau put in place in October that says you cannot board a, a plane at any commercial airport in Canada unless you are fully vaccinated, which also means you, you can't fly from Vancouver to Halifax, say. But, but more importantly, it means you can't fly from Toronto to England or Toronto to somewhere else in the world that perhaps doesn't have a vaccine mandate, which effectively landlocks Canadians, especially now that the United States has put in a vaccine mandate for its land border here. So your complaint, I'm assuming, is that the mobility rights that every Canadian has the right to enter, remain in, or leave Canada are, are being just completely obliterated by this mandate, correct? No question. It's section six of the, of the charter in which it says every Canadian has the right to travel anywhere in Canada or leave Canada. That's a fundamental right that every Canadian has as a result of the charter. And so yeah, there's no question. Listen, Canada is a nation of motion, you know, from the Mackenzie River to the St. Lawrence River, uh, to our explorers, to our later bush pilots, to the CN and CP moving across the nation. These movements were all part of creating Canada as we know it today. Without that rail line coming west, you know, who knows? Uh, whether what kind of a country we would, we would have today. And so movement and travel are integral to who we are as Canadians and in creating the country. And that history is very important. <clears throat> that was solidified uh, in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And, and so therefore, it's extremely important. And as you say, it also to leave Canada as well. That's part of that mobility right. And so it has severely restricted. I have law firms calling me from all over Canada about, uh, and, and industry, by the way, and industry lawyers who are saying they want to go to court and they want to challenge the federal government as it relates to this business of, of, of the mobility because it's now hurting our industry. It's hurting industries in Canada in their ability to, to, do, to do business. So it's extremely important. And there's been no cost-benefit analysis done to show that, <clears throat> that getting aboard a plane is any more dangerous than going to Walmart. You know, so th this whole business of this restriction has been done without justification, even if Section 1 of the Constitution applied. One of the interesting things about it is that no one, even at the height of the pandemic when the border was closed, no Canadian could be denied entry to their own country. This is the fundamental right of citizenship. The government could make it difficult for you, like demanding pre-arrival tests and quarantine, but, but no Canadian could be prevented from entering. And when they put the flight vaccine mandate in place, one thing I noted was that they didn't uh, put the mandate in place for getting on a plane to Canada. So in, in a way, the government was was acknowledging that this charter right exists, acknowledging that you can't prevent Canadians from entering their country, but they're not as concerned with it on the other side of it, traveling within the country or exiting the country. Well, I, I think both those points are extremely important. And perhaps the most important of those two is traveling within your own country. I mean, your family, business, and so on, from one province to another, making it more difficult. For example, the truckers uh, 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 convoy right now um, they wanted me to come to Ottawa to speak. Well, how am I going to get to Ottawa to speak? Uh, you know, you'd have to rent a big rig. <laughs> yeah. And so it would be very, very difficult for me to be able to do that given my other business activities right now, my other personal activities in, in, in having uh, interviews like this. I'm, I'm busy all day long from eight to 11. I'm doing interviews and doing public meetings and, and the like, and doing speeches online. So it completely inhibits my ability as a Canadian. And I know there's hundreds and thousands like me. And then of course, exactly the discriminatory nature of it. In yes, out no. I mean, that does not make sense. It's not consistent with any kind of law or reason that one can think about. But I come, I woke up this morning thinking about our history. And, and that was the phrase sort of that came up with, a nation in motion. We are, have been, ever since our first peoples, right, a nation in motion. They lived off the rivers. They lived off the coastline. They lived in moving in canoes and other uh, sea craft, right? Uh, we're a nation in motion. The Mackenzie River 
you know, is an operating river every day, right? The Yukon River, right? The, the well, same confederation, confederation itself, Brian, you've relocated to British Columbia. BC only joined Confederation because of the promise by John A. Macdonald of that transcontinental railway. That was the only reason they, they joined the country. So because there was an importance of moving people from and goods from one side to the other. And now you couldn't board that train. John A. Macdonald could not board that intercontinental train to go to BC if he weren't vaccinated. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is a complete uh, abdication of government's responsibility in our view. That's the argument we'll be making before the court. Of course, we have to argue that before the court and, and persuade them to sustain uh, our right of, of travel over uh, the other concerns that the government may have, which have not been completely articulated. And I think this is where our argument has a lot of merit is because on the other side, on the travel ban when it was instituted. There was no argument made as to why they were bringing it in, except that they had to bring it in because it was, it was going to affect the transmission of the virus. At the same time as they were knowingly been informed, they've just been informed in the last few months that vaccinated people receive the, the virus and transmit the virus just the same as unvaccinated people do. So their whole health argument seems to be crumbling and therefore to continue to insist upon this kind of restriction on our freedoms does not seem to us to be justified. Let me ask you then about the internal mobility here, Brian, because one of the responses that people would give is, well, there's nothing stopping you from driving. Your, your right to go from BC to Ontario hasn't been harmed because you could get in a car and go. It might take more time, but, but your ability to do it still exists. And, and what is the response to that? There's a number of responses to that, not, not the least of which is, is that the whole uh, uh, concept of, of, mod, mod, uh, of progression, of becoming modern. So you, you, you want to select what is no longer modern in our society and, and, and constrict that by, by, by some medical uh, condition, right? It, it sort of flies in the face of our natural thought of moving ahead as a country and, and progressing as a country, right? I, I, I find that very offensive. The other thing is, of course, it makes it more difficult. They're constricting the manner in which I can travel, right? And the whole idea of the mobility uh, right is your right to travel in Canada, full stop. It doesn't say by car, by plane, by train, or by boat, right? It is a general right of every Canadian. And so by restricting which way I can travel, that interferes with that freedom. Yeah, and, and I guess the extension to that, even leaving the country, there's nothing legally stopping you from, you know, getting a canoe and taking the Mackenzie River all the way to the Pacific and then perhaps uh, canoeing your way to Tuvalu or something. But, but in reality, the practical means of travel is, uh, is something that takes place by air. And when the government takes that off the table, they, they do effectively uh, tell Canadians they aren't allowed to travel. To say nothing of people that live on, on islands, Newfoundland, for example, where some ferries have put vaccine mandates in place, uh, depending on, on where in the country they are. So there are significant restrictions here that for all that Canadian leaders love to vaunt the vastness of Canada, they're now saying that Canadians, only some Canadians can enjoy that vastness. Absolutely. No, no, no question about it. And I find that, uh, you know, an, an argument that cannot be sustained, as you say, when a government goes about it, deliberately goes about the business of restricting your right as a Canadian, we know there's something, you know, fundamentally wrong. And this is what's happening right now. I think of the bush pilots, you know, what, why did we get into air travel at all then, in that case, you know, if you're going to start discriminating against some Canadians and how they can travel based on their medical condition. You, you can still go this way, you can still go that way. Well, that, that defies the whole nature and progression of our nation. And, and to begin, the, to enter into a world of discrimination, it seems to me, is a very, very slippery slope that we should never go down or even enter unless it is unbelievably justified in a very extreme circumstance. And this I is not extreme circumstance. Uh, on a lighter note, I have to correct myself. If you take the Mackenzie River, it's not going to get you anywhere near the Pacific. So I don't recommend following my uh, directions if you are trying to uh, canoe your way to Tuvalu. But but on a more serious point, yeah, you have to go around uh, around Alaska. But uh, uh, I don't recommend it this time of year. But 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 let me ask you, Brian, 
Go ahead. You can, walk, you can go up from Hay River and go all the way to the up top. There you go. Take a boat. But there you go. Then you can just uh, go across to Siberia. It might be quicker. But you can't do it. And, and it yeah. will take you weeks and weeks to do it. Let, let me ask you on a more serious point here about the way that governments are viewing this, because Section 1, which you mentioned earlier, this is, I, I'd say, one of the, the more dangerous sections we've seen in the last 40 years of the Charter, because it's the section that says all of the rights you're about to read are subject to reasonable limits. And, and the court has, of course, developed a, a test for that, a very, I, I know you're going to finish the line, and, I, and I'm gonna, I, I want you to do that, but I'm talking about how it's been perceived because governments have used this as sort of a trump card that they can just say, well, you know, this other thing's more important. And, and you are right, and I, and I knew where you were going with this. So tell me, why does that not capture the entirety of those Section 1 powers? Well, number one, Section 1 doesn't apply, in my view. As one of the writers of Section 1, it was meant to be in when the country's in a state of peril, insurrection or war. This is not a state of peril, insurrection or war. So number one, my number one argument is it doesn't apply. And therefore, the, the unconstitutionality exists. Number two, my argument is, even if you wanted to apply for argument's sake, and that's what you want me to do, engage in an argument on section one, you just mentioned, and this is one of the things people perceive it, because it talks about reasonable limits. Ha ha ha, there are four tests. The first one is demonstrably justify what you're doing within reasonable limits, by law, all in the context of a free and democratic society. You tell me that the government of Canada or any of the governments of Canada have met any or all of those four tests. In the case of the travel ban, they have not demonstrably justified that is necessary. Where is the report? Where is the cost benefit analysis? And where are the, and then free and democratic society means a parliamentary society. That's what Canada stands for, parliamentary democracy. Where are the parliamentary committees? We have 14 parliaments in this country. And none of them have been engaged in any w in meaningful way in discussing and debating these mandates. And therefore, two major conditions of Section 1 have not been met. And therefore, what is happening is unconstitutional. So I think on both counts, one, it doesn't apply. But if for argument's sake it does, on both counts, the government, uh, in my view, is acting uh, unconstitutional. And that's what we will be arguing before the federal court. I take what you're saying about the intent of Section 1, and, and you know, you're the last surviving of the architects and first ministers, so I, I think your words on this should carry a lot of weight, and, and I think do, certainly in my estimation, but we look at the jurisprudence on this, and, and courts have at times, especially in the last two years, it, it taken very broad interpretations of, of those limits, and we've seen, uh, not that they've gone to the Supreme Court, but at lower courts, we've seen government side, or uh, courts side with government on this. Looking back on this, is that a section that you would, if you were to go back to 1982 with the knowledge you have now, is this a section that you would uh, support in the way it's worded? And, and I guess what I mean by that is, do you feel that section one itself was a mistake in its in the way it was crafted? Or do you just no. feel that governments and courts have, have wronged? No, not at all. Absolutely. It wouldn't change a word. I wouldn't change it. I'll tell you why. Uh, section one was not negotiated in, in as section one. Section 1 was negotiated in the context of all the other sections of the Charter. And the Charter was negotiated in the context of all the other sections of, 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 of the Constitution Act 1982. That's one, what everybody forgets. That was the deal. If we go back and try to reopen that, other provisions of the Constitution will get changed. There will be more negotiations, more to and fro. Right? That's the danger that you face when you start to reopen things. Because you're not reopening just Section 1. You're reopening the charter. You're not just reopening the charter. You're re reopening the Constitution of 1982 and the Aboriginal rights of 35, the equalization rights, right, that are in there, the natural resource rights that are in there, the minority language rights that are. This was a negotiation on all these matters. Okay, so all these would come back in play, and Quebec would be there with other demands. So what we have in any reasonable person's mind, right? Uh, it, to me, especially with those, if those four conditions weren't in there, if we didn't say demonstrably justified, if we didn't say by law, if we didn't say in reasonable limits, if we didn't say free and democratic society. Now, yes, lower courts have ruled with the governments, but no high courts have ruled on this yet. And unfortunately, those two lower courts even forgot their own superior court. The Supreme Court of Canada ruled in 1986 about Section 1. The Oates test is called. And in the Oates test, they made it very clear 
that the, the onus was on the government to prove what they were doing was necessary. That's not even mentioned in the Manitoba case that went the government's way, nor in the BC case. That will be taken up, don't you worry, in all of the appeals that are going for in the Court of Appeal, because the courts themselves never even adhered to their own rules that had been established earlier by the Supreme Court of Canada. Talking about your case specifically here, as you've noted, there have been two years of legal challenges. None of them have made their way up to the Supreme Court yet. There's a huge backlog in courts as people uh, take lockdown fines that they've had and bigger matters like this to court. So this could take years. And in that time, the government could say that we're rescinding the mandate. The government could at this time, on at, using its government powers, take it away. There's a bigger point here, I think, which is that even if it takes five years to get to the Supreme Court and the mandate is long gone, the pandemic is declared over, there needs to be something on the record so that this never happens again. You're in it for the long haul, aren't you? I'm in it for the long haul, no question. I want to see the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the Constitution Act of 1982, restored in all its simple and plain meaning. That's what I want to see, because like I said earlier, if it's not, then it sets a precedent for another time and makes it far more difficult for our freedoms to be protected and safeguarded. So we're in for the long run. But remember, this action goes to the Federal Court of Canada. It's not in the province. It goes to the Federal Court of Canada. And then uh, either side has the right to appeal, depending on who wins and who loses, to the Supreme Court of Canada. We are asking in our application for an expedited hearing on this because we think this is extremely important for individuals who are unable to travel right now, and for business who are unable to travel. That's why yeah, it's not just you, I should say. There are other there are other applicants here who are being denied the right to see their family, not just to go on some vacation, but to see their family, to uh, uh, to do their work. There are a lot of things at play here. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I'm just characterized because of my former in, uh, involvement as first minister in mm. the constitution. I, I'm characterized as the lead sort of applicant, but there are other applicants a part of this legal action that we're taking. For the same reasons that you gave, that obviously there are many Canadians who are being, being affected personally and, and business-wise as a result of these actions, which have not been justified under uh, the Section 1. The Honourable Brian Peckford, former Premier of Newfoundland, before it was Newfoundland and Labrador, former Premier of Newfoundland, uh, Brian Peckford. Thank you so much for your time. Good luck with the case, sir. Thank you very much. Brian Packford, this has been a stellar week for guests, by the way. Last uh, show, I had Ann Kabukian, who I've already had many of you. Actually, I've had a few people say you should hire her at True North. I think she has a, a lot on the go right now, but certainly she's welcome back anytime. And Brian Packford, when I had him on the show some months ago, uh, at some point last fall or something as well, I had people saying, you got to have him back. You got to have him back. And his lawsuit against the federal government, I think, has been a, a great opportunity to do that. So happy to have Brian here and happy to have all of you here. We will have a, a special special edition of the show tomorrow with Dr. William Gardner looking at the state of the conservative movement in Canada. And on the weekend, I'm headed to Ottawa for the convoy. We'll have reports from there at True North, and I'll have a, a full update for you when I get back next week on the Andrew Lawton Show. So big times here. Thanks very much for sticking with us. We will talk to you soon. Thank you. God bless and good day. Thanks for listening to the Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.